This is a Scream Queen production. I'm Jen Carpenter, and this is So Dead Podcast. Happy Taco Tuesday, guys. It's time for another snack-sized episode of So Dead. This week's Taco Break is sort of an extension of last week's full-length episode, Lady Killer. Have you listened to that one yet? It is a crazy story, and when I was citing my sources for that one, I shared with you guys that, just by coincidence, a book was released on the case the very day before I started my research. Literally, the day before I started researching the case, a story came out. A book came out. A story? A book motherfucking book. What are the chances, right? That book, A Tangled Web, was written by Leslie Rule, the daughter of true crime icon Anne Rule. And that's who we're going to talk about today, Queen Anne. Because Anne Rule was born Anne Ray Stackhouse in Lowell, Michigan on October 22nd, 1931. That's a big sentence right there, so let's break it down a bit. First of all, how badass is the last name Stackhouse? Shout out to my fellow True Blood fans, which is one of my favorite shows ever, ever, ever. Which is strange, because I don't usually like gory, and that is a gory show, but I loved it. And the main character's name was Sookie Stackhouse. True Blood was based off of the Southern Vampire Mysteries book series by Charlene Harris, another author of All Things Macabre. So I kind of have to wonder if she named her main character after Anne as sort of a tribute. And I have to wonder, because I could find no proof to back up my little theory, Google failed me big time on that one. So back to Michigan, where Anne was born. Lowell is a town of about 4,000 people, just about an hour west of Lansing if you're headed toward Grand Rapids. It's not too far from our favorite Michigan town, Ionia, And like Ionia, Lowell is connected to quite a few strange murders, but we'll talk about those another day. The 1930s in Lowell were actually pretty chill, though. Uh, Anne was one of two children of Chester and Sophie Stackhouse. Chester was a high school football and track coach, and Sophie was a teacher. But many of the members of Anne's family actually worked in law enforcement, including her grandpa, Chris Hansen. And no, not the Chris Hansen from Dateline. He's way too young. Um, But that would be hella cool. It's just another really strange coincidence. I'm telling you, this family was destined to rule the true crime world. Chris Hansen, the original, was the Montcalm County Sheriff in the 1930s and 40s. He and his wife ran a mom-and-pop jail in Stanton, which is a small town about 45 minutes north of Lowell. So a mom and pop jail basically means that running the jail was a family business. The sheriff and his family would live in a house either near or sometimes attached to the jail and they would share the duties. So Sheriff Hansen kept the prisoners in line while his wife Anna cooked their meals for them. And when their little granddaughter Anne Stackhouse came to visit in the summer, which she continued to do even after she moved away from Michigan, It was her job to deliver the food her grandma had cooked to the prisoners that her grandpa looked after. When she was just nine years old, Anne befriended a murderess at her grandparents' jail. The woman was kind and patient and taught Anne to crochet and gave her good life tips like, never trust those women who pluck their eyebrows into itty-bitty lines. (laughs) I agree. Anne could not reconcile the friendly woman she knew with a woman who had murdered her husband in a crime of passion, and she would spend the rest of her life trying to make that dichotomy make sense. But before this story follows Anne right on out of Michigan, I do want to share a bit more about her grandfather because this is pretty cool. Chris Hansen was in law enforcement for 24 years and never once fired his weapon. He was viewed as a father figure by many of his constituents, the law-abiding ones and the not-so-law-abiding ones. Uh, Anne's grandpa was her hero because he was honorable. He was a good man. He 
fought for justice, but he also understood that humans are humans and we all make mistakes, and he was all about redemption and second chances. Uh, And it was because of him that Anne wanted to become a police officer. And she did, at just 22 years old. She was hired into the Seattle Police Department in the early 1950s when female officers were not allowed to carry guns and skirts and high heels were part of the required uniform. What kind of sexist bullshit? Anne was on the police force for less than a year when she failed an eye exam and was cut loose. So devastated, she did the thing that women were expected to do in the 50s. She got married, had kids, four of them to be exact, and she housewifed it up for a while. And then her husband was stricken with cancer and could no longer provide for the family. So Anne began publishing true crime articles in detective magazines as a freelancer. She still had contacts at the Seattle PD, and they gave her access to files and information for her stories, so she was very successful. However, she published her articles under the male pen name Andy Stack, because, as her editor pointed out, no one will believe a woman knows anything about crime. I wonder what she would think about true crime today, you know, with it being so popular and with so many women being at the forefront of the true crime podcast movement, true crime books, true crime shows, movies, all of that. I just, I bet she'd be so proud. Uh, In 1971, Anne began volunteering for the Crisis Clinic in Seattle, which was a nonprofit suicide hotline. Anne's only brother, Don Stackhouse, took his own life on New Year's Eve 1954 at the age of 21. He wrote his family a goodbye slash apology note, and then he sat alone in his car while it filled with carbon monoxide. Anne was never able to escape the guilt she felt over not being able to save her little brother, so she took to trying to save others from the same fate. She worked nights at the crisis clinic for years, and she befriended her hotline partner, a charismatic, handsome young man that Anne thought was too skinny, so she often fixed him sandwiches and took him leftovers from home. In 1974, Anne got her first book deal. The Seattle area was in the throes of a mystery. Young, pretty girls were disappearing under suspicious circumstances left and right. Anne thought the unfolding story would make a good story. Story. (laughs) Uh, So she submitted the proposal to her editor, and she was granted a contract with one big caveat. The book would only be published if the cases were solved. So Anne added just another iron to the fire. Single mother to four kids because she was divorced at this point, freelance journalist, crisis hotline volunteer, and now a budding author. As Anne worked on her book, the Seattle PD worked on solving the cases of the missing girls, which eventually they did. But the truth was more outlandish than anything Anne could have ever dreamed up to write. The killer, of course, was Ted Bundy, who was also Anne's partner at the crisis clinic. That funny, skinny guy with the big smile and the kind eyes. No, no, Ted Bundy did not have kind eyes. Which is easy to say because every picture I've ever seen of him, every video I've seen, he was already Ted Bundy. But I guess if you were looking at him through a different lens and you had no idea of what he was going to go on to do, maybe. But no, I still say no. And I know that most of you know this about Anne's connection to Ted Bundy, but it still just shocks the hell out of me every time I think about it. And Anne was shook, right down to her true crime love and core. But she still wrote that damn book. The Stranger Beside Me was published in 1980, and it remains Anne's biggest book because, come on, how are you going to be writing a book about an unknown serial killer as you're literally working alongside that serial killer who is your friend? That doesn't happen. She went on to write dozens and dozens more books about true crime cases all over the globe. I wanted to showcase a few of her stories that focused on Michigan crimes, But that proved ridiculously hard to do unless I actually sat down and went through every single one of her books, which I did not have time to do. One I know she covered, though, was the case of Michigan-born serial killer Gary Addison Taylor, 
who I talked about on episode 28, Lock Monster. Which, how ironic, because Taylor was killing pretty young girls during the same time frame as Bundy, in the same area as Bundy. Some of their victims were even friends, and the police had, and possibly still have, some of their victims mixed up. Their profiles were so similar. Taylor was showcased in Anne's book, You Belong to Me and Other True Crime Cases, and his story is called The Computer Error and the Killer, which that's not the best title for a chapter, but when you're Anne Rule, you just do whatever the fuck you want, okay? That aside, though, I'm not sure what Michigan cases she's written about. Hey, maybe you guys can tell me. Let me know. In addition to being a crime writer, Anne was a crime fighter, which, I mean, I guess that's how she started out, being a police officer and all, but in her later years, she was a fierce and fearless victim's advocate. But she did also remain friends with Ted Bundy until he was executed, so there is that to consider, too. Anne's last book, Lying in Wait, was published in August of 2014 when she was 82 years old. By then, Anne's daughter, Leslie, was also an accomplished author, although her books focused more on the paranormal than true crime. Anne's sons were another story. In early 2015, Andrew and Michael Rule were charged with theft and forgery after taking advantage of their mother's fragile state, So by 15, her health was failing, she was in a wheelchair, she was on oxygen, so she just, you know, she was getting old and she lived a long, hard life. They built hundreds of thousands of dollars from her estate. They would yell at her, threaten her, bully her. One of her sons would threaten suicide, which he knew was her weakness, whatever it took to get her to write them a check. And on the occasions that she refused, they would forge checks. And they stole hundreds of thousands of dollars from their ailing elderly mother. The case was still pending when Anne Rule died after suffering a heart attack on July 26, 2015. What a sad, sad ending for such a badass woman. But her legacy lives on, both on its own and through her daughter Leslie Rule, who has now dipped her toes into the true crime world. If... Somehow, you haven't read any of Anne's books. Do it, do it, do it. You've got time. I know you do. And if you haven't already, The Stranger Beside Me is definitely the one to start with. It is fucking fascinating. So my sources for this taco break were uh, Leslie Rule's A Tangled Web. Again, the gift that just keeps on giving. I already had Anne Rule down as a topic to do as either a taco break or a full episode if I could find some Michigan cases that she had covered. But at the beginning of A Tangled Web, there's a whole thing about Anne's history in Michigan. And it was just like meant to be kismet perfect. So uh, yeah, Leslie's book was the source. And then Wikipedia, Find a Grave, Goodreads, some of my go-tos. Well, not Goodreads. I usually don't use that, but I use that for the bios and the dates and stuff for Anne's books. Anyway, uh, that is all I've got for you today. Just a reminder, though, there is a full-length episode coming next week, and then Sodette is going on a mini hiatus for a little bit. I know, I know. I won't be gone long, I promise. In the meantime, stay safe out there, guys. And as always, keep shining, you magnificent what-the-fucks. 